Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome again. Uh, thank you for joining us here um, for our Sunday evening service. Um, it's truly a privilege to have you all and to be able to host uh, this service in this manner. I know we are not all together physically, uh, but we are here because um, technology has made it possible for us to enjoy this time together, to enjoy some fellowship and enjoy some sharing. Um, some time in uh, praise and song and just hearing from the word of God uh, what God has been doing and is, has done and is doing in, in and through your life. I want to say a big shout out to all those who are awake from uh, our Europe, European students, so Germany and UK. I know William, you're there. Uh, thank you for waking up in the morning and showing up. I know there's quite a few Germans, Philip and Micah, I saw you there. Grace, I saw you there and quite a few of you there. So thank you for getting up and um, being part of this uh, service uh, this evening. This is our last Sunday night together for this school year. Uh, we are actually gonna have our commencement at the end of this week, and I'll let you know about that at the end of the uh, service um, tonight. But this is our final Sunday night sharing time. And I wanna encourage you and challenge you to take advantage of this time together to share with each other what God has been teaching. Um, don't waste the time. We want to maximize the time. And so prepare your hearts, prepare your minds. Um, please share. And we want, to, we want to maximize the time and give you the opportunity uh, to share with each other what God has been teaching you. And we want to hear um, you proclaiming Christ. And when Christ is proclaimed, faith is produced. And we want to grow in our spiritual walk with God. And that's by sharing Christ with each other. So that's what's going to happen tonight. Barry's going to come up and uh, lead us in some praise and worship. And then we'll basically have the rest of the evening uh, for some sharing time uh, together. Thanks, everyone. Psalm 40. It's for the choir director, a Psalm of David. It says this. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts towards us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. 
Do not delay, O oh my God. Amen. We serve a God who is our rock, and, and although we're weak and so many troubles can surround us, we can bless the Lord and we can praise him. And so we're going to do that by starting to sing, Blessed Be Your Name.
we have a God who we can trust and we can depend on. When uh, the storms come, he is our rock and our firm foundation. <clears throat> um, earlier, uh, a little, little bit ago, there was a new song that was introduced called Christ Will Be My Hideaway. And um, you may have heard it or you may have not, but we're going to sing it. We're going to try it here. It's a new one for us. And um, may it be a blessing to you. And it's a reflection off of uh, Psalm 91. So there's lots of parts of it that um, come from that, directly from that psalm. So Psalm 91.
<clears throat> in Lamentations, uh, which is a very sad, kind of a somber tone in uh, that book, Jeremiah. In the first three chapters, Jeremiah is just pouring out his heart of the trouble that has gone on. And uh, he comes to a bit of a conclusion in chapter 3, um, although it, it continues on after that. But one of the things that he comes to realize is pointed out. And uh, I just want to read those few verses in Lamentations 3.19. And it says this. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we've probably heard those verses often, but it's true, and how much do we live by it? That we may have the troubles that are going on around us, but do we actually wake up and think, great is your faithfulness, your mercies are new today, and your loving kindness, your love never ceases, and we can depend on you. You provide for all that I need. Uh, so we need to be people that live like that. So in that reflection, let's sing Great is Thy Faithfulness.
To you be the glory, God. You are the one that deserves it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your great rescue, that you've come to rescue us by the blood of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Uh, may we never be tired of the gospel, and may that be good news, um, not to us just every day, but to others that we spread the news to. Thank you, Jesus, your faithfulness. Thank you, thank you for your steadfastness your reliability, your love, your great love for us, your grace and your mercy. To you be praised, to you be glory. Amen. So I became a Christian later in life. I was 21 years old. I got invited uh, to church by a friend's family. And at that time I was uh, driving semi truck for Budweiser and selling drugs at the time. I made a lot of poor decisions in life. And much of it was because I was trying to find life. I was looking for fullness of life, but I was just looking to my own desires and my own pleasures. And it really left me empty handed. And um, I ended up uh, going to this Bible school, uh, Timberline Lodge out in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, a torchbearer center. And it was there that I began to hear about this truth that I would no longer have to live according to my own strength, but the ability to live a new life. It was this message that was just simply Christ in you. That, that like as important as Jesus' death was, amazing, and then the life that he lived, that his resurrection and offering us his life is like the ultimate game changer. And so I, I remember beginning to understand bits of this truth that, that the God of the universe would offer me his life now. Um, but, but how does this truth work out in everyday life? And um, it was this passage that really began to challenge me. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. And I began to realize the reality in order to experience a new life, I would have to die to my old life. Laying down of my desires and my pursuits, but not just to leave me empty, but to give birth to something even greater, new life, namely His life. And I realize in many circles, that's not a popular statement to say the call of the Christian life is to lay down your life, but it's in order of giving up the lesser that God might give the greater. And I think this is the invite that Jesus gives all of us to lay down our lives that we might experience true, full, real, abundant life, His life. All right, good evening again. Thank you for joining us. That video, that's Zane Black, good friend of ours. Uh, he's been one of the guest lecturers that's been here for many years now. Uh, teaching different series, and um, just good to have him share on video. Really the life that we're called to live, laying down our self so that his life could live in and through us. And that's the beauty of Christian life. It's not our life, but it's his life where he is living in and through us. This evening, I want to um, give you the opportunity uh, to share with each other uh, what God has been doing and teaching you. Uh, if you've been here on a Sunday night service, you know this is where we ask our students to share with each other what, uh, specifically what God has been teaching you through the, uh, the book that was taught the, the week before. 
Uh, but uh, today, I want to open that again. We had the book of James uh, this last week. Elizabeth Jocelyn, who was singing up here, was teaching that book um, this week. And I want to open up uh, for you to share spe specifically from that book, but also I want to open it up uh, to just reflect on the whole year, as this is our final Sunday together. Uh, what has God done in your life through this year uh, at Bible School? And we want to hear um, His life. We want to hear, really, His activity. Uh, in and through your life. So you know the drill, put your, raise your hands uh, with the raise hand option on Zoom, and then I can put you in onto the main screen. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You put your hands up and then I can, uh, I can see the, uh, the list here and then I'll put you in one at a time uh, so that we can hear what God has been teaching you. So uh, don't be shy, take this advantage. This is your, really your last opportunity uh, in this context, unless you come back for LTS next year. Uh, but really, this is the opportunity to share uh, with each other. So just keep raising your hand, and I'll put you in uh, one at a time. All right, first we have Gil and Tracy. Hi, everybody. Um, Gil and I were just talking. How, are, how would we sum up what we've learned uh, this year? It's not possible to do in 60 seconds. But what we did learn is that we never stop learning because God never stops teaching. And because we're his kids in our 50s, um, we're his kids and he's our dad. And we have grown this year in our faith and in our marriage. We've healed a lot. Um, and we're leaving here in three weeks. We're still on Thetis Island. Uh, we leave in three weeks. And that's been, as you know, uh, painful. We've had time to prepare for this, and you didn't. Um, but God's been giving us such a peace, and we're actually just now starting to get a little excited not to go back to Brampton, Ontario, that's for sure, but um, for what he has next, because there's more learning, more growing, and because he's our dad and our teacher, we get to say, what's next, Papa? So we're excited about what he's going to do, because he's a good God. He's got a good plan. No matter where you are on your journey, fasten your seatbelts because it, it never stops and it's good. Thank you, Tracy. Um, good word there. Never stop being a student of the word because God is always teaching and we need to be available and willing uh, to learn from him and to really grow in our relationship with, uh, with him. So thank you for sharing. Josiah. Hello, everyone. Um, we heard this several times just in the music today, but God is faithful. Um, but to say that, that doesn't mean you don't do anything. Um, um, Bible school might have been a challenge. It might have been a ton of fun. It, I hope it was both. Um, and we're going to move on to new things, whether it's LTS next year or a job or school. And remember that God is faithful. Remember that whatever he's calling you to, he is basically to do it. Um, but also, you need to show up. And you just need to do it. Um, so rely on God and show up. Um, continue on, just as you have it in Bible school, out of it. Um, don't see this as a transition in the sense of learning to doing, because learning and doing never stop, wherever you are. Good. good. Thank you, Josiah, Thank you, Josiah for sharing, for sharing reminders. those reminders. You serve a you faithful, serve a God. faithful God. Jacob. Jacob. Good evening. How's everyone doing? I'm, uh, you know what? I'm just, uh, I'm still in awe. Just the, uh, even the last two months, uh, I mean, trying to get into class as much as possible. Uh, I know I've been very diligent in it, but I'm, I'm getting, uh, you know, I've been, uh, I've been busy and, uh, I mean, as hard as I, uh, as hard as I fought to stay away from the whole recovery side of life, it's, uh, you know, it's been a blessing coming back here and being able to, to serve and to, to work with people. And, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it, it might not be a permanent thing, but it's, uh, just seeing God's hand all over the situation and just, you know what? being able to go, you know what? Okay, dad, you know what? I know you don't 
you know, I don't understand, or I, I mean, I don't quite, uh, I mean, I don't understand what your plan is for me, but you know what, I'm just going to let you take the reins, and uh, finding peace in Christ, I think, is, is the biggest thing, even since coming to Bible school, there's a lot of inner turmoil, and a lot of uh, stuff going on in my life, and I mean, uh, once I just, I mean, everyone always tells you, I mean, it's as simple as, I mean, letting go and let God, and I mean, I used to hear people say that, and I get so frustrated, and I mean, it's okay to admit to God and go, you know what? I can't deal with this, or I, I don't know how to deal with this. And so I'm going to step back, and this is where you're going to step in. And you know what? You're my father, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll guide me the best way, uh, better than I ever could. And uh, it's just been uh, finding peace, finding peace and turmoil and getting rid of chaos in my life. That's what uh, Bible school in this last year has been about. And uh, yeah, I thank everybody being a part of that great thank you jacob for sharing with us you're truly a testimony of god's work um testimony of his activity and there's evidence of that in and through your life thank you for again being here this year and just being available uh, to god to do his work in and through you so um yeah keep standing firm keep pressing on keep loving and serving him and keep allowing him uh, to transform us really to his image. So thank you for sharing. All right, who else? Okay, Joel. Um, am I on? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, I just want to first mention a uh, Appreciate Elizabeth Joslin teaching on James, and there's some verses that have stood out to me. Um, I may have known them in the past, but yeah, I just want to read them. Some James 4, verse 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. And, um, yeah, it just made me think um, we need to draw near to God. And so we um, need to seek him, make an effort to, to, uh, um, to seek him, yeah, to, to draw near to him. And I was thinking also what Richard Dahlstrom mentioned uh, last Sunday night about in Psalm 46, um, that God is our refuge and strength. I was going to read a few verses, uh, one to three. Um, so God is a refuge and strength, a very, very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. And uh, yeah, I just really appreciate what he shared about how we need to um, um, uh, seek companionship with God and that the goal in life is to know God and that storms come into our lives. And there are a lot of unknowns. And yeah, I was thinking also this whole COVID-19 situation. Um, it's just hard to see. Yeah, like what, like we see more of what's present, but we don't really see the future of it. Like, I don't know, like we got it out for a reason. Maybe this can cause people to come to Christ. I don't know. But uh, you know, God sees a bigger picture. And I was thinking these verses, you no. Know, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our, way, than our, than our ways. And, um, but definitely, I think when we depend, you know, we realize how much we depend on God and, and um, we need to draw near to him, especially in times of uh, trials. And, uh, um, and I just want to also take this, this moment to thank um, all the, the teachings we received um at school all the guests the speakers all the staff i just really appreciate it all and also um the, in fact we can listen to class on zoom um that, that's just really helped me out during this isolation period um and just still seeing students on zoom um yeah I was, so i want to thank everybody for all the got involved in that and uh also the words of encouragement um that has encouraged me too so just thank you all for that. And um, yeah, praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Joel, for sharing that. 
If you are not on Zoom, you'll, Joel is someone who always stays behind after class to hang out with whoever is uh, staying back to just enjoy some fellowship. If you remember at the beginning of April, we had, I don't know, 25, 30, 40 students who would stay back to enjoy some fellowship. And uh, last week, I think we had 15. And at the end of the week, I think there were seven. And then it came, go, keeps going down. But Joel is always there. And he's always asking, how are you doing? Good to see you. How can we pray for you? Um, and thank you, Joel, for being that encouragement to your fellow students, to us. Um, yeah, just the evidence of God's activity in and through you as well. So thank you for sharing. Let's go to Grace. Hello, good morning or evening. <laughs> um, I actually came prepared, so uh, I wrote down a little something that I'm just going to read. So, you know, um, so throughout this year, I have gotten to know a person that is so much more than I ever thought. He's not only my savior, but also my father that cares about and for me. He's a loving, caring, as well as disciplining father that wants me to grow with him and come to him whenever something's happening. He's going to be there no matter what, because he isn't going to change or walk away because of what we do or think of him. He was there first and will be there long after us. He isn't surprised of our sins, but he isn't happy about it either. He provided a way for me to come to him and give him my sins so I can be free to start over. He sent Jesus to die with him and resurrect after three days, and now he lives inside of me so I can truly live. All of the Bible teaching conversations I had and the overall experience uh, during Bible school drew me clo so close to God and closer to God than ever it was. And now that I'm back home, he hasn't changed. Coming home, a lot of things have changed, myself included. But holding on to the one that does not brought, brings and will bring me through whatever lies ahead of me in my future life. I'm learning to hold on to him when my feelings are trying to overwhelm me and to take my strength and joy out of him. It truly is a life-changing moment if you experience the true joy that Jesus Christ is and that he really has for you. I'm learning more and more that I do not have to be dependent on people, feelings, or circumstances. I can be dependent on Jesus that already has everything I ever needed and that I'm going to need. I don't need to fear because I know the one that holds my future, and I know it's going to turn out exactly how he plans it to be. And he has a good plan and purpose for me, because, which means that my future is going to be good because he's holding it. And will everything be filled with constant happiness and be super easy going? For sure not, but that's not what he promised. Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That means also going through trials, hardships, and darkness. But one of the things I learned, and I'm still learning, um, is Romans 5, verses 3 to 6, where it says, But we also exult in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So it's on us to step out in faith and seek Jesus in everything. And with that, denying a human nature that tries to tell us we could have everything under control because we never had a will. And um, we can try, fail, and get anxious and try even harder, but that's not what Jesus wants us to do. He's already got everything in his hands and under his control. And everything that's left for us to do is surrender and thank him for the work he did, he is doing, and he's going to do. Amen. Thank you, Grace, for sharing that and for preparing uh, your heart and your mind and your thoughts and those words. Um, it's truly, really again, a testimony of God's work um, throughout this year. So thank you for sharing that and encouraging us with that. Alicia. Hello. Um, I was just looking over my notes from this last week, um, and there's a line that I wrote down that says, uh, we can allow God to shape us and etch us like the Grand Canyon, um, which I think is a great picture. Um, so I just thought about it a little more. Um, and the Grand Canyon was formed over a period of thousands of years. Um, the water took its time. If you sat there every day watching the water, you probably wouldn't notice what it was carving until you looked back. Um, and in a likewise manner, God takes his time on us 
our transformation won't be overnight. It'll be over our entire lifetime. God is making each one of us into something beautiful and has asked us to be patient. Inwardly, I've noticed I am naturally not a very patient person. Um, so this has proven a little difficult for me, but I know that God is strengthening me every day and he will do the same for you if you ask. Um, so that's one of my prayers every day that he just um, continues to grow my patience and um, yeah, just really strengthens me in him. Um, and just overall, I've really appreciated my time at Cape Henry this year with all of you um, and um, all the love and patience you have shown me um, and all that ultimately has just revealed um, parts of God's character to me. Um, yeah, it's been really special. Um, I'll miss you guys. I love you all. Thank you, Alicia, for sharing and for those good reminders there as well. All right, Jonathan. Hello. I'd just like to read a couple of verses that I really, or that really stood out to me this year and that I really discovered that they're so true and that they really present God's character to us. And the first one would be... Um, Psalm 1, verse 1, 2, 3, and it says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he mediates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields and fruit in its season, and its leaves does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. And something else that really stood out to me was Isaiah 26, verse 3 to 4. The one that remains faithful, the, st oh, sorry. <laughs> the steadfast of mind, he will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. And sometimes I'm just completely overwhelmed thinking about how incredibly blessed we are and it is so comforting to know that a God who we can trust with everything, like with our fears and our imperfections and our joy and with just everything, he takes everything and he called us out of our circumstances into his kingdom. And that's just incredible. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that and for reading those verses. I appreciate that. Okay, a couple more people. All right, Anna. Hi. So I've learned a lot this year, more than I ever thought I would. Um, but I'd like to share one of those things. Um, and that actually comes from my stargazing, which most of you girls will remember me lurking on the sidelines of the path and startling you when you look over. But um, even when there are no stars in the sky, one of the things I learned was that if I looked at the sky, I'd find something. Like, even if it was cloudy and I couldn't find a star, there was always something for me to find and to look at. And um, I want to read Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And just the stargazing taught me that if I stood still and I looked and I waited and I searched for God, he would be there and he'd, he'd show me that he was there. And yeah. Good, thank you, Anna, for sharing. Good reminders there. Cody. Oh, hello. So since I've been back home, like I've had a lot of people ask me like, what, uh, what was the highlight from Cape and Ray? And like, honestly, like 
the biggest thing that or like it's like life changing and I'm a pretty independent person and I like to do things on my own and like the past year God's really put it on my heart and put me in like so many situations that like I'm completely out of control of and like um yeah so like this past year has just been a, like a big time of just learning to trust God and trust his judgment over mine I guess and like just sitting back and relaxing and not worrying about what I can and can't do and like just realizing that he's in control and like his plan is obviously better than mine so like it's yeah I don't know that's been a really eye-opening thing and like just seeing him in every situation that I come across even when I'm back at home God's not just got a cape and raise got it wherever wherever I am wherever you are and so yeah, that's been really encouraging to see and see his faithfulness and everything and every or everywhere that I go. So, yeah. Good. Thank you, Cody, for sharing that and that reminder. Emerald. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, All we right. can. Cool. Well, I'm sure most of you guys can agree that this past year at Bible school was an incredible experience. Um, but for me, I have never felt so weak. And it sounds strange, but coming to Bible school, um, it was a time of coming to realize how weak I really was how little I could do on my own. And it took being rendered completely incapable to be, do anything by myself, to be completely broken at Bible school, to come to realize how much that I need God and how much that I have to rely on his strength. And it, it, it reminds me of... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, um, when Paul is talking about the thorn in his flesh. And verse 9, it says, Each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. And honestly, I just think that's so amazing because it's so easy for us to beat ourselves up for our inability to do things on our own because we're not strong enough we're not good enough and it's true on our own we're not any of those things but with christ our weakness can become strength because he is the one working through us and coming to that realization was not a pleasant process it hurt <laughs> but it's it's a really valuable thing that I feel I've retained <laughs> coming home. I, I see how weak that I am and that weakness drives me closer to God because I know that without him, I can't do it. And that's, that's something that I hope that all of us can come to know with a deep heartfelt knowledge that we can't do this without God. And it's just, it's incredible because it doesn't matter how weak you feel because it doesn't matter how insufficient you feel because God's truth tops it all. He is enough and his strength becomes our strength when we rely on him and allow him to live the Christian life through us. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing that Emerald. Very good reminder there. Sam. Hello, everyone. Um, something I was reminded of even when hearing, just hearing Emerald's um, testimony. Uh, she was talking about uh, weakness and I've been going through um, First Corinthians just in personal devotions. And uh, there's this one line that uh, stood out to me. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 
to, well, I'll read till th I'll read one to three. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Um, when I came to Cape and Ray uh, first two years ago, um, I thought I was very aware of my own weakness, um, but I had this weird balance of, not, not a good balance, but of a lot of pride and yet a lot of shame. And so I thought that in being aware of my faults and aware of my, where I, my shortcomings uh, and my shame, I thought that that was my humility. I thought that was uh, me just having a realistic perspective. But throughout these two years, what I've really be, been noticing is that the emphasis isn't necessarily on our, on our weakness, although we are weak, but the emphasis is the power of Christ and the power of the gospel. He says in there, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I've been really realizing um, this past year, especially just um, the power of the gospel itself and the power of Jesus and power of that message and how transforming it is when we actually take our eyes off of ourselves and we take our eyes off of our own weakness, off our own strength, and then we cast them upon Jesus and he, we realize, yes, we fall short. Yes, we are so underneath, but he, in, through his death and through his resurrection, there is nothing, all this weakness, all this fear, everything that we might experience right now, everything that we might realize about ourselves right now, none of it's relevant in the context of us just allowing and trusting him and allowing his spirit to work. Um, yeah, I'll try not to ramble because I do that a lot, but yeah, it's just been uh, an amazing couple years. And so thank you so much to the staff and thank you so much to you guys uh, this year. You guys were so great. Um, this year, uh, I don't want to compare it to last compared to last year, but Cabin F, a special place in my heart, you guys, but all the boys and all the rest of you, my home group, you guys are all great. And uh, I hope that we can a lot of us can stay in touch. Peace out. Good. Thank you, Sam, for sharing that. I appreciate your reminders and your thoughts there. Okay, Rebecca. Hello. Um, I had to take an opportunity to say some final words just because this journey at Cape and Ray has been unforgettable. And I'm uh, also one of the oldest students of um, this school body. And uh, with, as Gil and Tracy were saying, like, it's amazing how you just, there's always still so much to learn, even having grown up. Um, in this faith and one thing I'm so glad that I'm always um, reminded but I'm always seen is that it's true God is good uh, and what ties into what Emerald and Sam were just sharing um, I felt like Psalm 73 26 was kind of put on my heart which says my flesh and my heart may fail as we all know we all make mistakes and get things wrong so but my flesh and my heart may fail but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Um, and I just want to let um, Liz know that, uh, again, like all the other weeks, it's got so much practical teaching and applicable teaching to our lives, just remembering the power of the tongue and how there's life and death in the tongue and how we're to use it to build one another up. Um, and also to put action behind our faith. It's not just... Um, enough to believe in God as the demons believe in God, but to allow his life to become our life. Um, and, you know, we have been given such a great opportunity to dedicate these past months 
to studying the word of God and having it taught to us. And so, as she said, that we would have faith fixed always in truth. Hallelujah. So we continue on now um, past Cape and Ray. But as we've been saying, the Lord is the same Lord that we've been serving all this time. And so I just pray that as we've all learned more of his character and more of his truth, that it would become a reality for us. Uh, so I um, pray that we will stay connected within the body of Christ and encourage one another and pray together and continue in friendship together. Um, last year, I struggled, I think, getting overwhelmed by people. And this year, I just couldn't get enough of the people. And I think that's the Lord growing in me. But also, you're just a rad bunch of his kids uh, who I love dearly and I will miss, but also pray and hope that we'll stay in contact. Um, and so just as kind of a final thought, Philippians 3, uh, starting in verse 7, um, talking about things that we can gain in this world. Solomon gained it all, but knew it was all worth nothing. But whatever things we gain, uh, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but derived from the law, not, sorry, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. And it goes on to speak about how we haven't already obtained it. We're not perfect, but we press on towards the goal. And so I just pray that we'd all press on in him and know that he holds you as Grace was saying, he holds your future. And I look forward to seeing you on this side of eternity or there and to celebrate together. We'll have a different commencement there, hey? But love and blessing to you all. Thank you, Rebecca, for those thoughts and sharing those verses with us. Um, yeah, truly a reminder of a faithful God who works in us um, and really the, his activity and becomes our activity that comes out of our faith uh, in Christ Jesus himself. I was really, as I was listening to Liz teach uh, this week in the book of James, I was really struck by, um, again, the 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 link between faith and works and how um, the works needs to come out of your relationship with God and out of that faith in God it needs to produce uh, God's activity it needs to have the evidence of God's activity in there and book of James is really full of practical things um, where Br James the brother of Jesus is really um, emphasizing the thoughts that Jesus himself said uh, but really practical things to live the Christian life today. Because if you think about it, in our lives, um, wherever we are, we are never settled there. We are always really looking for what's next, and we are always being, thinking about what's coming up. If you were, if you were a student here uh, this year, you were thinking about spring break, you're preparing for that, you're thinking about what, what to do after Bible school, what to do in the summer, there's all these opportunities, you're thinking about next year and thinking about LTS, you're always thinking about what's next. Part of my role here uh, at Cape and Ray is to design the, the, and put together curriculum, and I'm thinking about next year and how that's gonna look like and who, what are some guest speakers that we should have, what are some, some books that we should uh, teach, Think about the summer programs, if we are able to do any, how do we prepare and plan that? Maybe some of you, you are looking forward to a job. Maybe some of you are looking forward to a new place, a new location. And so you're, wherever you are, you're never really settled there. And you're always thinking about moving forward and you're always thinking about what's next. And really, as I was uh, thinking through the book of James, um, one thing that came up was, can we really prepare for what's coming up? <coughs> or how do we prepare for what's coming up? Or how do we prepare for what's next? We are all looking forward to when this pandemic is over and we can all um, socially engage, get back to our jobs and 
uh, get on with our lives. We're, thinking, we're looking forward to a, a change, a, a, a different job or a different place or a new school or a new setting. And all of us, when, when there's something coming up, sometimes we get excited, as um, Gil and Tracy were saying, now they're getting excited. But there's all, there also, there's, many of us feel nervous as well. Because whatever is coming up next, it means that there is a, is a transition. We have to get from here to there, which means there's a change. And whenever there's a change, there's stress. And you probably noticed that already with the change in our social norms, uh, it's stressful. And so the question I had, I had to ponder about is, are there really things that we can do now to prepare us for what's next? to prepare us for what's next. Because since we are looking forward to it, we haven't really experienced it, but can you really be prepared for what's next? Or what's coming up? Or for the next season, or the new job, or the new place, or when things open up? Can we really be prepared? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, and that's really what the book of James, uh, as Liz was explaining it this week, the answer is yes, we can be prepared for what's next. But we got to keep two things in mind here. First one is that whatever you're packing for what's next, whether that's be the next new job or the new place or the new season or the new home or the new normal, whatever we are packing for whatever is next, the reality is you always pack yourself. You always bring yourself with you. You don't leave you behind. You bring you with you. And so with everything you pack for what's next, you pack you. What that means is wherever you go, there you are. Many times we, we fool our minds by thinking that, oh, once I finish Bible school, then I'll be able to do this. Oh, once I am able to socially engage again, then I can do this. Oh, once I get a job, then I'll be able to make some money and give generously. Oh, once I start dating, oh, once I have a new home, oh, once I do this, then I can do that. And we think that if we can get a new place or a new location or a new setting, somehow that's going to just change you. But the reality is the new setting or the new place or whatever is next doesn't result in a new you. You are still the same person. And the, and the fact is that there's no correlation between knowing what's next and being prepared for what's next. There's no correlation between knowing what's next and being prepared for next. We don't know what's next. We don't know what the summer looks like. We don't know what the next fall looks like. But that does not mean you can't be prepared for the summer, for the fall, whatever is coming up next for you. A great example of that is that um, wedding ceremonies. If you've ever been to a wedding ceremony, you know how the bride and the groom, they, they exchange vows. And both of them, they say, I do. Do you do so-and-so, so take so-and-so? Yeah, 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 I do. Right? Well, I do doesn't mean that I know everything that's going to happen starting today. No, no, no. I do means that I just plan to do whatever comes in front of me. When I said I do... I wasn't really thinking about our future kids and how now I have to like potty train one and I have to deal with the potty training and the, and the effects of that. Man, it's, look, yeah, it's just crazy. I didn't know that when I said I do. When I said I do, I, ju I just meant, well, you know what, I plan to do it. I don't know what tomorrow is, but I'm prepared to do it tomorrow. So instead of a plan that you don't even know what it is, it's always better to be prepared. Preparation for what's next is so much better than a plan. Well, fortunately, we have a lot of help. And as you were reading through the book of James, and I, as I was reminded of this, James, <laughs> famous brother of Jesus, if you remember, James wasn't one of the disciples of Jesus. He thought Jesus was crazy. His brother was crazy. His brother can't be Lord at all. But when Jesus died, he thought, oh, what a waste. <coughs> but when he rose again, James is like, uh-oh, he's wrong. And now he becomes one of the leaders of the early churches. And James believed that his brother is Jehovah. 
James believed that his brother is Adonai. And James, in his letter, as you already read this week, this is what he says. He said, if you do what I ask you to do, if you do what I ask you to do, you will be blessed in what you do. What you do. If you do what I ask you to do, he says, this man will be blessed in what he does. If you turn to James chapter 1, verse 22, this is what he says. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. In other words, if you think you heard it, and that it's going to make a difference, you'll be fooled. And the illusion is that, yeah, I attended Bible school. Now I'm a better person. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm part of a Bible study. Now I'm a better person. Oh, I listen to this music, so I'm a better person. James says, don't, that, don't let that deceive you. Well, what makes a difference? This is what he says. Do what it says. Do what it says. See, there is... There's something in us when we are in a, in a Christian setting, whether that be in a, in a church setting or you're listening to a sermon or you're in classes at Bible school and a speaker comes up and shares. Um, there's something in us where we hear it, we hear the message, we hear the sermon, we hear the song, <coughs> we hear the scripture read, and you feel convicted, you feel convicted, and you say, yeah, you're right. This is bad. I feel, I feel so convicted. And, and, and you take that as your religious experience, and you go home, or you go to your cabin, and, and you tell your cabin mates or your, your family, or whoever you're hanging out with, you say, you know what? That was a good, good sermon. That was a good message. I felt so terrible, and so I get credit with God. Well, James says, don't deceive yourself that way. Just because you heard something doesn't mean it's making a difference. The following verses he says, verse 23, Anyone who listens to the word and does not do it, does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. James here is saying, the point here he's saying, hearing something and doing nothing about it is like waking up in the morning and looking at a mirror and saying, oh, that's horrible. Look at my hair. That's a mess. Look at my eyes. That's a mess. And just like looking at the mirror, just putting on some clothes and then it's going to work. Well, seeing and not doing it's like looking in a mirror and not doing anything about it. Which is something that no, none of you would ever do. <laughs> because when you see something, you do something about it. When you see something on a mirror, you do something about it. Because a mirror requires a response. A mirror requires a response. That's why some of you, you showed up late for breakfast because you were responding to what you saw in the mirror. You saw something when you wake up in the mirror and you're like, oh yeah, I gotta fix that. And you combed your hair and you walked out of the door. You're like, no, it's not right. You went back to the mirror and you're like, maybe it's a hat day. So you put on a tuke and then you walk down. And you're like, no, 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 something is different. Oh yeah, 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 I need to fix this up or fix that up. And, and, and you took time to respond to what you saw in the mirror. And some of you were late for class. Some of you were late for breakfast. Because you responded to what you saw in the mirror. But the reality is, no one really gets credit for just looking in the mirror. If you woke up in your cabin and you, and you, you, were like, you had your hair messed up, you had like dirt in your face or whatever, and you just looked terrible, and, but you looked in the mirror, you're like, oh, that's terrible. I don't look good. I don't smell good. That's, that's horrible. That's terrible. And then you just walked out of the door and you came to class. And at the door here, uh, you came to Sony. And Sony's like, hey, <laughs> what's wrong? What happened? I can't let you in a class like this. And you might go to Sony and say, but Sony, I looked in the mirror. Nobody gets credit 
for just looking in the mirror. But we often do the exact same thing with our Christian life. Because we look, we hear, and we say, oh yeah, I looked and I heard. I'm not going to do anything about it. I just saw and then I, that's, that's enough. James says, don't deceive yourself that way. If you're in a habit of just looking or seeing something and not doing anything about it, well, you will be in a habit of seeing something and not doing anything about it in the next season or whatever is coming up next. This is what James says, verse 25 of chapter 1. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Huh. Intently. That's when you're walking and you saw something, you stop there and you're gazing on it. You look carefully into it until you figure it out. It's not a glance or a stop. And, it's a stop and a stare. Perfect law. Well, Jesus... Asked his disciples, what's, what, sorry, disciples asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, well, there's two greatest commandments. Love your God with all your heart, your soul, and strength, and then love your neighbors as yourself. But if you remember John chapter 13, just before Jesus was crucified, he told his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, and this new commandment is, love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus says, and James here says, when we do that, there's freedom. Love one another as I have loved you. Well, how have you loved us, Jesus? Well, you have forgiven our sins. And you still forgive us. Well, if you think about it, forgiving doesn't really sound liberating. It doesn't really sound freeing. Sometimes forgiving someone feels like that you're being punished for someone else's fault. And they're just getting by it. And I have to say, okay, I forgive you. Well, that doesn't sound liberating, but all those who have actually forgave someone, you know there's freedom in forgiving somebody. Forgiveness is liberating because God forgave us so that we can forgive others. And, and James here is saying, when we stop and gaze at the mirror of this law of liberty and do what it requires, there's freedom. There's freedom. And he says, do what it requires and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. See, James, is, James here isn't saying that God will bless whatever you do. That's not what he says. James here is saying that you will be blessed in the doing. You will be blessed in what God called you to do. The habit of doing will make you happy. Isn't that true that when you wake up and you look at the mirror and you're like, oh man, that's horrible. But then you spend some time fixing it up. You wash your face, you brush your teeth, you comb your hair, put the makeup or whatever you do on. And, and then when you're ready, you're like, all right, that looks good. There's something satisfying when you respond to what the mirror requires of you. There's something fulfilling when you're doing what God asks you to do. That's why being a doer now is a preparation for being a doer in the next season or in the next chapter or in the next job or the next situation. Even when the situation changes. See, Jesus said the exact same thing in a different way. Um, in Matthew's Gospel, he said, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down and the, and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it has its foundation on the, on the rock. See, what Jesus there is teaching us and you and me is that the only way to lay a solid foundation is by being the doer of the word. Not just the hearer, but the doer of the word. Because when things get tough and hard, when the situation changes, when the new place comes, or the new job comes, or the new season comes, or the new normal comes, you won't fall down. Because you did that you knew that you were supposed to be doing. You did that thing that you knew that you were supposed to be doing. Being a doer now is a preparation for being a doer in the next season or the next 
chapter. So I want to leave you with these two questions. What are you doing now that you shouldn't be doing now that you tell yourself that you won't do it later? In other words, you're thinking, oh, you know what? When this thing happens, then I won't do it. I'll stop doing that. Oh, once I get a job, then I will stop doing that. Oh, once I actually uh, able to make some income, then I'll stop doing that. Oh, once I fill my time, then I'll stop doing that. What are you doing now that you shouldn't be doing now that you keep telling yourself that you won't do that later? And the second question is, what are you not doing now that you should be doing now that you tell yourself that you will do later. When we gather as a church together, then I can have a Bible study. Oh, when I have a routine in my life, then I can schedule my devotion time. Oh, when I have more money, then I'll be generous. James says that you are deceiving yourself. Jesus said, that your life will come tumbling down because they all knew what to do and didn't do it. Doing and not hearing is what makes a difference. So really the question is, what do you need to do so that you can be prepared for what's coming next, even when the next changes? Because every time you go to a next, there's something next. Every time you go to the next season, there's a new season coming. There's always going to be change. There's always going to be transition. There's always going to be the new thing that's coming up. But you can be prepared for whatever is coming up by being a doer now, today. That's why we saw and heard from all of you here sharing. It's not really you're doing in the sense that you're trying to, it's your self-effort, but it's God's doing. That his activity, that's the right, his righteousness, not self-righteousness, but his righteousness. And that God's activity needs to come out of that relationship with Jesus, as we already heard from Psalm 1. You need to be the tree planted by the water that will produce fruit in its right time. Being a doer now is in preparation for being a doer now. So ask, ask yourself the question, evaluate yourself. What are you doing now that you shouldn't be doing now that you keep telling yourself that you will do later or you won't do later? And what are you not doing now that you should be doing now that you keep telling yourself that you will do it later? Don't deceive yourself by just being the hearer of the word, but be the doer of the word. I hope this year, as you spend time here opening God's word, you heard messages and sermons and sessions and classes and teacher, teaching and opening of the word and sharing from each other. You, you heard a lot. Now it's time to do it. Apply it. It needs to produce fruit in our life because it's his word, his activity, his fruit. Allow God to show areas in our life, opportunities in our life, things in our life where we need to be allowing his activity, not just waiting for when things get ready or when things change or when the new season happens. But what is God asking you to do today? To allow him to fulfill his activity in us. And I want to leave you with those uh, thoughts this evening, just as an encouragement um, in your walk with Jesus. Doing now, being a doer now is a preparation for being a doer then. Thank you all again for sharing this evening. I know um, there's more that I want to share. And if we had uh, the time, we would have um, had all of you or more of you share. But thank you for those who are sharing. And I want to continue to encourage you to share with each other, whether that be through text or phone call or a Zoom meeting or whatever that is, to continue to share what God is doing in and through your life and what God is revealing. Even if it's a very little thing, share it with each other. And that's how you grow in your spiritual walk. I want to say a couple of announcements and then we'll wrap this up here. Um, this week, we will have our national director, Charlie Fordham, who will be teaching um, three sessions, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. He'll be doing the Sermon on the Mount, um, which is from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
uh, 10 a.m. in the morning uh, BC time here. And I would encourage you to join in. And for students, that's on Zoom. For those who are watching us on Facebook, you can catch those sessions on our YouTube channel. If you still haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can jump to our YouTube channel. Just type in Cape and Ray Harbor, hit subscribe. That will notify you every time we post a, a new video and you can follow along uh, those. We'll be uploading pretty much daily uh, a new video up there for you. And those are really preaching of and teaching of the Word of God. And so Charlie will be teaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We won't be having any classes Thursday and Friday, uh, but on Saturday, May the 9th, we will be doing an online commencement ceremony. And this is a very exciting opportunity that we want to offer and host. Uh, 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, BC time again, uh, for all our students and staff on Zoom, we'll be hosting an online ceremony uh, right here from the lecture hall. Um, and for those who are your friends and families and our Cape and Ray friends who want to watch it online, we'll be live streaming this to our Facebook uh, as well as our YouTube channel. So you'll have two venues that you can watch uh, the live stream uh, of the ceremony. Now, I know the ceremony won't be the same as we would have 100 or 200 people in the lecture hall building and have them, uh, our students come on stage. But we'll do something similar online uh, with some various elements into our program there, some videos, some uh, greetings, some uh, congratulations and commendations there, um, and some speeches and things like that. And so we're looking forward to that. Uh, for our students and staff, it is a formal event, so we're going to dress it up. Uh, Take time to respond to the mirror um, and then show up uh, for the 10 a.m. Uh, ceremony on Saturday, uh, May the 9th. So formal event on Saturday, May the 9th. For friends and family that are watching uh, on Facebook and YouTube, you don't need to dress up. You can if you want to. Uh, that's great, but you don't need to dress up. Uh, but wear something. Well, we can really see you, so it's all good. Um, but that's going to be uh, 10 a.m. on Saturday. And that will be really our wrap up of our year together. Um, we won't be having regular classes after that, but we are hoping to put together some uh, weekend conferences or some Bible teaching time together in the months of May and June and into July and August as the Lord leads. And we'll let you know if there's some opportunities like that uh, open and available for you. But this Saturday will be our final gathering together as the student body uh, for the Bible school year 2019-2020. So, that's what's happening this upcoming week. I hope you join us uh, tomorrow morning uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. and uh, listen to Charlie, who will be teaching, and then you'll be able to join us uh, on Saturday, May the 9th. Students, if you are not able to attend our commencement ceremony, please let me know by email so that I can um, make sure that I know who, who can't make it. I know a couple of you already said because of your schedule and things like that, but most of you should be able to make it, and uh, I hope you will prioritize that time together just to celebrate what God has done uh, and really is doing in and through our lives. So that's just announcements uh, for this evening. I want to say thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for taking your time. Uh, to be here and to share with one another. Thank you for those European students who got up early in the morning. Now it's probably breakfast time for them. Um, and thank you for, again, participating uh, in this service this evening. Have a great day.